Hey there everybody, welcome back to the Vintage Sewing Machine Garage. Uh, you now ha are getting uh, a bit of an aerial view of the Granina 530 record. Um, I'm going to take the top off here. I had threaded it so that we could make the uh, testing video that I did. But I'm going to take the top off you guys because I want you to see something. Um, and we'll get right up here. And I want to show you something that unfortunately is is not uncommon this can happen with any vintage sewing machine okay i'm not picking on bernina's per se but in this case uh the bernina is is the um, machine that we're dealing with it can happen to a lot of machines that sit remember i've told you guys that machines uh when they go into hibernation they sit for long periods they i, I like to say they go to sleep and getting them to wake up is not always easy. Uh, you may remember the iconic scene in the iconic film, The Wizard of Oz, where Dorothy goes up to the Tin Man and he can't move and she starts squirting him with oil and uh, eventually he's able to move again. Well, this is really, uh, that's an overly simplistic way of talking about sewing machines. But um, when I first got my hands on this machine, I started to check certain items, right? So I noticed that when I turned, my, turned the hand wheel, the needle moved. I had needle bar movement. That's good. That was not frozen. I was also noticing that in addition to the, um, uh, this knob, the one you see me turning, this uh, adjusts the width for zigzag. So it goes from four all the way back down to zero. And I had really good movement. Now, when I first got the machine, I'm always very gentle, right? And I started turning and it turned. It didn't fight me. It didn't resist, which was surprising because zigzag movements in vintage machines often freeze up before the vertical straight stitch movement. That's been my observation. So that moved and I thought, oh, that's great. And then there's an adjustment down below here that you can, uh, you can adjust this button, which allows you to, um, to uh, uh, create automatic buttonholes if you want. I'm not a fan of built-in buttonholers, but you know, by the early 60s, companies were putting them into place. So this moved. However, uh, all is not good, okay? Notice this button. Now this, in this outer knob adjusts for needle position. Now you'll notice it's sort of moving. Wait a minute, not, not you, you stay still. This one is moving but with effort. Now, when I first got this, this did not move at all. It was like moving stone. And I, when, it, when I tried to turn it and it said no, I stopped. That's how I always tell you guys, never force a knob or a lever of any kind. If it doesn't want to move for you, either you're not moving it properly or it's frozen. And you will damage it very likely if you try to strong arm it. Don't be like a big gorilla and try to overpower the machine. You will lose and you will be very unhappy. So, um, so obviously I wanted to get behind here. This adjusts needle position. Okay. So you can sew either way. Now we're going to, we're going to get closer up and I'll show you what it is that is being fussy and fighting with us here. If you look right here, this piece, this, uh, this little section here would not move at all. Okay. When I turn the knob, the one I was just showing you guys, you'll notice now, see, notice that this just moved. And if I turn it to the right, it moves. It's not completely working yet, but this is 100% better than what I had. I couldn't get it to move at all, and it was supposed to for needle position, okay? But this thing, this knob apparently may never have been used. Maybe the original owner never saw fit to use it. There are a lot of features people don't always use because they don't see the need or they don't, they don't have an interest, and that's fine. But remember, the machine has sat for a long time, and when a feature doesn't get used, or oiled, it freezes, and this one did. So how did I get it to this part? We're not out of the woods yet here, okay? But how did I get this to move? Because it, well, the first thing I did is I started with uh, sewing machine oil. And remember I told you guys before 
uh, in a number of other videos, I think I've mentioned that, remember, whatever, whatever knob you have behind it in a vintage machine should be steel, right? These are metal parts. These metal parts are what's sticking. It's not the plastic on the outside. So you don't want to try to force it there, okay? Uh, what do you want to do? Well, right <coughs> here, what I started to do was I started to apply sewing machine oil here, here, and even below. And then there's, let's zoom in here so you guys can see a little more closely. I'm gonna have to point so you can see. There's a, there's a place, this piece pivots right here. Okay, so I put oil here. This is not a normal oiling point. There's no red marker. You know, Bernina didn't plan for you to have to oil this. There's, an, there's a linkage here. There's another piece here that moves, right? And so sometimes you don't know, right, what's supposed to move until you can get it to move. So when I do this, notice when I push this back, you see these, this, these two pieces just move, right? So when I know that, and then I thought, oh, I've got to, I've got to lubricate this over here. So it's, it's sometimes it's a little detective work when you're dealing with a new uh, design that you've got. So oil alone did not do it. What did I do? I took, got to zoom back out or you'll never be able to see what this is. I took, in this case, a heat gun. Now the heat gun, you can see this one I have, has a low and a high setting. If you don't have a heat gun, if you've got a hair dryer that has a fairly high heat setting, you can use that. Um, or, you know, heat guns are not that expensive, but whether you use a hair dryer or a heat gun, guys, you need to be very cautious and respectful with them. In addition to the fact that they get so hot, you can burn yourself. You can also damage the machine if you're not careful, okay? Now this would be true even if everything in here was steel, but remember this down here is a nylon gear. And then of course we have the other nylon gear here. And I'm happy to report after having done my detective test stitch run, as far as I can tell, okay, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm about 75% sure that there are no cracks in these gears. And that's very good news for me because <laughs> I really don't want to do a gear overhaul. And it's good news for the client because I would have to charge so much more to get them replaced. They're just a, like I say, it's, it's doable, but it's, when I say labor intensive, I am not kidding you. Uh, if you ever get a quote in a, in a, in a service center, you will, you will um, pick yourself up off the floor if you hear much, how much it will cost. Anyway, so this is what I did, okay? Now, don't get discouraged. For example, I, I applied heat this, in this direction, okay, he did not put the heat directly on that gear, and even put, uh, what else did I do? Um, well, we'll get to that in a minute. We have another issue with this machine where it's not wanting to cooperate. But right now, I have got movement here, right? So when I turn this knob, see my hand down here, when I turn it to the left, it goes like that. When I turn it to the right, notice eh, it doesn't want to go all the way, right? It's it's, it's still being a little cranky. I'm not done. Now, the, the point I wanted to make, though, with you guys is <clears throat> the, there is old oil inside of here that is acting like glue. When I applied heat, I used the low setting. I did not use the high. Heat guns get very hot. I cannot emphasize this again. They are often used for people. People have sometimes removed paint off the side of their houses with them. Okay. And they have other purposes, other use. I use them for heat shrink on things like cords and stuff. But they are very hot, okay? Like really hot. So really, I highly recommend you don't use your higher setting. Um, and when you apply the heat, you apply it, you know, for, I don't know, 30 seconds, 45 seconds, maybe a minute. You're going to have to judge. You're going to have to gauge this for yourself. But when you do, do not angle, first of all, don't put the heat gun right on it, okay? Give yourself some space and be sure to not point it toward anything made of plastic or you're going to ruin it, okay? So after I did this, uh, I was able to ascertain, you know, that the, that the nylon gears were not getting hot because that, you just don't want that, okay? You cannot use a heat gun if you're going to be having to get too close to the nylon gear. That's just silly. Now, one thing to note, the first time I applied the heat gun and the oil, I went, tried to turn the knob, nothing, okay? 
I came back, I did it again, nothing. <laughs> the third time I started to get a little bit of movement here, just a little bit of a wiggle. That was it. I went back, put the heat on, and then added some, a few drops of oil, and eventually, eventually, I started to get movement, and this is where we are. So we're making progress here, guys, but it's slow, right? Slow is good, okay? Slow is good. If you move quickly, you can damage the machine. And we're gonna see how much of the machine we can wake up. I never know, and this is why, you know, the main thing that I have to consider when giving my client an estimate, because this is not a machine I bought. You know, if I buy a machine, you know, in my, part of my purchasing series, I restore it and I put it online and I price it depending on how much I paid and how many hours I've spent. <clears throat> and also if the machine's collectible, most of them are not. Occasionally I get one, uh, if it's a featherweight, they sell for more just because featherweights sell for more, period. Even when they're not overhauled. So this is where we are here. Um, now, that's not the only place we're having issues. The plate, and I'll show you the top, because it, it, when the top is on the machine, this is what you see. You see a lever that pokes out of this slot, and it is designed for you'll see different settings. It's got zigzag, and then I think that's a blind stitch. These are all decorative stitches along with blind. And then there's a second lever to the right. Let's see if I can do this without knocking the tripod over here. So <clears throat> when, the, when the lever is down, okay, it's set for zigzag or straight stitching, okay? If you want to do decorative stitches, you have to move this lever up, and it'll say 1 through 13. This particular model had 13 uh, <coughs> stitch types. Now, here's the thing. Here is this lever. When it's moved up, okay, now it's in the position. This has to be up here in order to use these decorative stitches. Well, the decorative stitch lever is stuck. So you see all these little teeth here, right? And they're hidden by the, by the, by the, by the beauty cover up top. Uh, but notice this pops out, right? It's been oiled, okay? It should slide upward so that this little pin here, give me a pointer here, this little pin will lock into any number of places that co coincides with the, the stitch type. And that's how you select your decorative stitches. After oiling and applying heat, I'll show you how this little little device uh, is set up to work. I'm going to lower. We're not having an earthquake here. I promise you, it's me lowering the camera. Now, I want you to see. I want you to see this from a different level here, so you can see what I'm dealing with. I think I'm going to need the flashlight as well. Um, I'll get the flashlight for you guys. So you'll have a better view. Okay, guys. I had to actually move the camera. I'm actually holding it by hand because I couldn't get the tripod to cooperate here. But this is what I want you to see. You see here, there's a there's a there's like a double rail system here with a gap in the middle. And when you pull back on the stitch selector, it is supposed to, this little piece here, what looks like a black uh, bolt housing, is actually supposed to slide up that rail system to allow you to select whatever stitch you want. And I am currently using my heat and oil trick and so far I've only been able to move it half a tooth up. So it's really fighting me and being obstinate. So at the moment that's where I am with this adjustment. So that's where we are guys. That is currently where we are with the Bernina. There are other procedures to attend to. Um, and uh, one of them, of course, is removing the top of the free arm because we need to get in there. There's a number of areas we need to cl potentially clean and certainly lubricate. And then I'm going to be taking off the bottom and trying to get access to this knob here to make sure it can function. Uh, it needs to be cleaned and lubricated. When I say clean, cleaned of old oil, which is acting like a cement that's, that's causing it not to, uh, not to function. And then there's a side panel that uh, should allow us to get access to some of these uh, levers here on the side. So 
that's where we are, guys. I uh, just wanted to show you um, if you get a Bernina that doesn't cooperate, these can be some of the reasons it doesn't want to. And uh, again, patience is really important here. And there's never a guarantee that we can get them to work, but we're going to try. As long as I know that those gears are not cracked, and I believe, as I've said, about a 75% chance that they're okay, then I'm a little more interested in moving forward based on my normal uh, estimates for what it costs to overhaul one of these. Um, anyway, I appreciate you all watching. Again, uh, if you have a Bernina that works flawlessly, congratulations. If you don't, fear not, because you can certainly get your old Bernina to work again. Uh, it just may take more time and sweat and potentially tears in order to get there. And that's true not only of Berninas, but most every European design sewing machine I've ever come across. Um, not sure why that is, but there it is. And uh, I'm sure there are exceptions. There are definitely always exceptions to anything. But Berninas are uh, a wonderful brand. They have a long, wonderful history. And they make gorgeous stitches. And they are just really strong sewing machines and I think <clears throat> I think they're worth saving uh, even though this is technically with those two nylon gears I guess you could call this one of the first hybrid machines the Japanese took longer to, to start mixing in plastic because their labor costs were lower but you know labor costs in Switzerland by the 60s were pretty high and they were already looking to to try to find some way to to lower costs um, which is surprising because so much of this machine is beautiful gorgeous steel and other metals and um, again all of the companies ended up doing this but again it's this is a, a Bernina it's one of their great machines made in Switzerland and we're going to do our best to see what we can do with those getting those uh, I'm a little more optimistic about this needle position coming on coming awake it's starting to wake up gradually it's still groggy but uh, as far as this we'll see what happens we're we're still not out of the woods with that yet but Cross your fingers, and if any of you have had luck in getting that unstuck, I would love to have you share, as I share, we all share with each other online. Um, but anyway, uh, this is part and parcel of vintage sewing machine restoration, and when you finally get a machine to work after after having struggled with it, it, it feels really good. But uh, uh, we're not there yet, so <laughs> anyway, Keep your fingers crossed, guys, and uh, if you have any helpful hints to share, please put them down in the comments below, and we will see you in the next video. Take care.